I thank you for gathering us together tonight, that you are always with us, that we are always experiencing you and help us during this time to become even more sensitive and aware and attuned to your presence in our lives, that it may fill us and flow through us and that we might be your instruments of peace and love and grace and mercy into this world. And for this time that we gather together, I ask your blessing upon us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 All right. Well, tonight I have the pleasure of wrapping this up. And as some of you who have been coming to the last four sessions, we started with experiencing God. What does it mean? and certain qualities of a God experience we had talked about in that. And then we moved to experiencing God in the ordinary. And then uh, talked about last week about experiencing God when we fail. And lucky me, tonight I get to talk about experiencing God when we don't experience God. So it's a little paradoxical there. Um, I'm going to... Uh, mute everyone. If, if you probably all are muted, but I'm just going to do that before we go. And then I'm going to share my screen with you all. So here we begin with experiencing God when we don't. And this is in no way exhaustive. And uh, it's based off of a lot of personal experience, I guess, because I've been there sometimes. But when I was thinking about uh, not experiencing God, I kind of felt like it fell into two separate categories in the sense of the, there's been people in my ministry and just in my personal life that have said in their ordinary life that they don't experience God, that they have no sense of God in their lives. And that kind of makes sense to me when I've heard people that are not people of faith, not people in the church say that. But there's been some folks that I have known in my ministry that have come to church Sunday after Sunday, even raised in the church all their life, and they would say, I never experienced God, which is heartbreaking. Um, it also makes me wonder how they categorize that experience and thinking that perhaps when they say that they've never experienced God, that it's because that they have a, um, a limited understanding or don't have the vocabulary to really pinpoint it, that perhaps they're thinking that an experience of God is something that, you know, a lightning bolt, a voice, an overwhelming feeling. And because they haven't had that, then they say they haven't experienced God. But particularly in our first session about what it means, um, we talked about how really being human is to experience God and that there are certain qualities of the God experience that I just wanted to highlight to everyone as we reflect on this, that you know, the people who have expressed to me that they've never experienced God, I may push back and say, have you ever experienced some awe and wonder? or even the longing to experience God. I mean, you've been showing up to church all these years. Um, forgiveness or peace or power, answered prayer, connection or love, that oftentimes when folks say that they haven't experienced God, it's because they're maybe not using the correct frame for their life. And that when we put these qualities of God experiences around our frame, that it will highlight to us that in fact, we not only experience God on occasion, but all the time. And so that's one way of um, the category of folks who say that they don't experience God in their ordinary life. The other kind of category that I would go to is the time of dark times and crises, which maybe um, most of us are more familiar with in our own journey of faith. And that we experience God or don't experience God in both public and private spheres. Like in the public sphere, we might look at the classic is the Holocaust. Well, where was God in that? Or in chattel slavery? Or now in the global pandemic where national politics are, are uh, tearing us apart as a nation. That those are times that perhaps we feel that we are not experiencing God and wonder where God is. 
But even when it's in the public sphere, it probably generates some um, personal response and emotions. And so we can either have these dark times or crises in the public or more probably more common in our own personal lives that um, feelings are certainly triggered when we feel like we are not experiencing God. And some of those feelings include hopelessness or fear, or some for some of us, shame or a sense of being unforgivable or the situation is unforgivable. And oftentimes it's this sense of being isolated, alone or abandoned. So I probably don't need to go into much explanation of what it feels like to not experience God, because I believe that the experience of not experiencing God is probably universal. And I hedged my bets and put the word probably in there because there may be some people out there that have always gone through their life and never have like ever felt alone or abandoned, but I would say they're the exception to the rule. And I would push that even and suggest that it may be even an essential part of the faith journey to have the experience of not experiencing God in your life. And although it may be an essential part and may be a universal experience, nonetheless, it's very hard to talk about. And um, we don't hear a lot about it in church from people of faith. But I like to turn to this quote that church isn't to be the happiest place in town, but rather the most honest place in town. And so if we're honest, we probably all could have a story about um, not experiencing God in our lives. So on that note of not necessarily being the happiest place in town, but the most honest place in town, I will share with you my own experience of not experiencing God. And let me reference again, that whole part about that it's hard to talk about. So I will do my best. Um, many of you are aware of my own kind of personal story that in 2012, my husband died of colon cancer and um, my kids were 12, 11, and nine. And that was a tsunami of uh, destruction in our lives. But that would not be the time that I would say that I didn't experience God. In fact, in that time, it was so public and um, sad and heartbreaking. And I think familiar to people because we all have uh, experienced death in one way or another that the community really wrapped their arms around us physically and spiritually. And um, I think even my kids felt the experience of God. It's not that time that I felt that I didn't have the experience of God. It's uh, another time and, and it's been sprinkled throughout, but one particular season of life I can think about, and I can't be too specific about it because it has, it's part of other people's story. And so for privacy, I'll keep it vague. But there was a time in my life, and I'd say a season that went on for an extended amount of time that, um, my life kind of went off script and that God wasn't showing up the way that I felt like God really should be showing up. And so there was a tension between um, what I thought God should be doing and what God wasn't doing. And there was a big rub for me. And during this whole season of feeling um, that tension, there was a, um, particular moment where I found myself in a hospital and I wasn't in the hospital, but someone I cared about was, and I was feeling very desperate. And so I called on the phone, a couple people to ask them to come for me. And for various reasons, they turned me down and did not come. And so as I look back on this season of not experiencing God, it is that moment that was the darkest uh, time that in this hospital corridor, I felt so isolated, so abandoned, so full of shame, so full of fear, no hope in the future, and just wept and wept and wept. And 
I hope I never feel that way again. But that was the real moment of despair in my life. So it wouldn't matter to me at that moment, all the sermons that I've preached that God is with us, couldn't care less about Psalm 139, about where can I flee from the presence of God? And it tells us, you know, you can go to heaven or Sheol or any other place and God is still there. Not caring about Romans chapter eight that says nothing can separate us from the love of God. At least for me, when I was in that moment of despair of not experiencing God, that is all I knew was that darkness and that despair. And I didn't give a crap about what the Bible told me or anybody else. But thankfully, that's not where I, I uh, remained. And um, so it was a moment and it was a season. And I still cannot explain it all. And but I do believe that it's part and parcel of the journey of faith, that it wasn't that I lost my faith, but that was part of the faith journey. So I want to take that personal experience and perhaps you can think of your own and reflect a little bit more within the context of our Christian faith about what it feels like and what it means when we're not experiencing God. So I would say that our tradition witnesses to the fact that um, that experience of feeling abandoned um, and lost and alone is again, universal and part of the faith journey. That in the Psalms, particularly the Psalms, there's many Psalms where we are called Psalms of lament and depending on how you categorize them, they may be even the majority of the Psalms and lamenting Psalms are Psalms when uh, people are like bringing it to God and saying, what's going on here? We don't get it. And so I highlighted this Psalm, Psalm 13. This is a personal Psalm of lament. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I bear pain in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all day long? To me, that sounds like someone who is not experiencing God and um, knows that darkness in his or her life. So that's a personal Psalm of lament. Then we have Psalm 44. In Psalm 44, in the verses before we get to verse 24, the psalmist lays out this more communal experience that Israel as a nation is going through some kind of crisis. And the psalmist is so bold to say that Israel has been doing what they need to do. They've been faithful. They've been remembering God. They've done, they held up their part of the deal. What about you, God? And they really push back and challenge God about what's going on here. Why do you hide your face? Why do you forget our affliction and oppression? And really give God an earful about not showing up the way that they expect God to show up. That God was not following the script. And finally, Psalm 88, verses 14 and then 18. Verse 14 is, O Lord, why do you cast me off? Why do you hide your face from me? And you can see this theme about, particularly in the Psalms, that I think not experiencing God is translated in this metaphor of God hiding God's face from us. But then verse 18 of you have caused friend and neighbor to shun me. My companions are darkness. And what I thought was particularly interesting about that verse is in the translation that we use in our church, the NRSV, it has the word in in it. But in the actual Hebrew scriptures, there is no in present. And I wonder if it's perhaps the translators there for the NRSV that felt so uncomfortable about leaving the psalm. This is how the psalm ends, that you have caused my friend and neighbor to shun me. My companions are darkness. That that sounds, again, like someone who really is um, suffering and only knows darkness. And so a lot of the Bible tells stories about God kind of following the script in general, that somewhere in the end, God comes through, God rescues and saves the day and sets everything straight. But these Psalms and other places in scripture 
offer a witness to really a counter testimony that sometimes our lives do not follow the script. In fact, I would again say that almost universally at some time or another, our lives go off script of what we don't expect that God does not come through the way we think God should and that there's a real rub in it. And so that this witnesses to the messiness of that faith and that also that it is part and parcel of a life of faith. It's not um, when you do not experience God or when you go through a faith crisis, that doesn't mean that you are not faithful. It means that you are right with your brothers and sisters in the faith who have gone before you and probably are all around you as well, but just don't want to talk about it. So we've got the Psalms and the Old Testament, but also probably the biggest hitter for me when reflecting on not experiencing God and it being part of the Christian faith would be our Lord and Savior, Jesus. And particularly turning our attention to his comment on the cross, and I guess comment is pretty light, his cry from the cross, which comes from Psalm 22, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And many folks will maybe suggest that this psalm is just Jesus pointing to the psalm, that this is the beginning of a psalm that doesn't end in victory, but certainly ends with a little more hope than why have you forsaken me? But I would kind of push back on that and say, if Jesus wanted a different tone, he could have picked either one, a different psalm, or he could have picked a different verse even in Psalm 22. There are other verses in this psalm that are more like, help Lord, come to my aid. But that's not what Jesus said or you will rule forever and ever. That's towards the end about this, like God's gonna, God's got this handled. But that's again, not what Jesus chose to quote, that Jesus went with the, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And I believe that it was authentic, an authentic cry of genuine despair that somehow with Jesus laying aside his divinity, that he didn't go into the cross going, I know, I know in three days, this is all gonna work out. I just gotta grin and bear it, just hold out the time here. And I know the suffering is gonna be over. That somehow this was authentic um, on Jesus's point, that he wasn't play acting and that he really wondered where the hell is God in all of this? Because if Jesus was fully human and experienced what we experience, like in Hebrews, it talks about we have a great high priest that can sympathize with us. And that the point is that this great high priest, Jesus our Christ can sympathize us with us because he knows what it's like to be human. And so if it's true that one of the universal experiences of being human includes this sense of not experiencing God, then I would say that Jesus, particularly by saying this uh, psalm, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me, reveals to us that even he knows what it's like to feel God forsaken. Even he knows what it's like to not experience God in a moment of great despair and crisis. So what do we do then? What do we do when we don't have a sense of God's presence? And as you probably guessed, I don't have three easy steps, but I do have some things to consider. And most of this is stuff that really we can only hold and let bake into us when we're not in crisis, that when we really are in the depths of despair, that that's, this is not gonna get through, but perhaps this can be something that um, you can grow in, and maybe you already know it, but I know these truths are something that I need to continue to be aware of and to let seep deeper and deeper inside of me. And the first one is, is to know that these moments of um, not experiencing God really is part of the faith journey, that we are not alone, that our brothers and sisters in Christ, in faith, in the human uh, community have gone before us and have been there in the darkness. And that for me, 
there is some comfort in knowing, knowing that even Jesus had a moment of saying, where are you, God? And that type of despair. And then also kind of, if we can take a step back from it, if those qualities of a God experience that we had talked about in particularly the first two sessions of experiencing God, that if this longing for God and no, feeling that rub that God isn't showing up the way that God needs to show up and wanting God to show up, that longing is God's spirit working in us, that that is a God experience. Although again, when you're going through that crisis, Maybe you are, but I'm certainly not thinking, oh, even my longing is a God experience. Doesn't that make me feel good? No, there's not consolation for me, at least. Another thing, though, that we can do if um, when we don't sense God's presence is to let trusted others into the darkness. Not everyone. You don't need to pour out everything that's going on in your life, but to let some trusted others in. And for me, um, when I did that, there was one particular friend of mine who uh, said, let me be one of those people in the story of the paralytic that um, perhaps you recall in the gospels that there's this paralyzed man and his friends bring him to Jesus, carry him to Jesus. And when they show up, it, the room's packed. Jesus is in a home and it is packed wall to wall. And so these friends bring up this paralyzed man onto the roof, dig a hole and lower him down before Jesus. And so my friend was saying, I know you can't pray, which I was not able to pray for some time, but I, with my prayers and the prayers of others, let us hold you and lower you down before Jesus. And just having that sense for me brought some comfort that I can't do this, but somebody else will stand in the gap for me. And that's another thing about this um, not experiencing God thing that often it, it's isolating and that we fool ourselves and think it's just a one-on-one -on -one relationship, but that is never the case, that our relationship with God is also part of the community. And that when we let some trusted others into the darkness and that they are kind, that they are loving, that they believe for us, that they pray for us, we, again, if we could take a step back from the extreme feelings that we're feeling, even that, that love and kindness is a God experience, that they are being God's Christ to us, that they are the flesh and bones of God in our darkness. And so we really aren't alone, even though sometimes it's hard to grasp. Another thing to do when we don't have a sense of God's presence in our lives is to just simply hang in there and to recognize that God is playing the long game, but not playing, but that sense of that there is this perspective that we do not have and that there will be ups and downs that this is part of our faith journey. And it will not always be this way. Whatever it is, you can guarantee it will not always be this way. And finally, kind of a little bit like hanging in there, to trust God anyway. That God is not looking for us to have all the answers. God's not looking for us to have this triumphant kind of life where everything is smooth. That ultimately, God desires a relationship of connection with us that is grounded in love and ultimately trust. And that every time we experience not experiencing God, that that gives us an opportunity to trust more deeply. So that's my reflection on experiencing God when we don't experience God. And I now offer to you some questions for discussion. And as in the past, we'll take five minutes to look at these and you can write them down or just ponder them. And then we'll break into um, small groups and discuss them.